Adelaide is the capital city of South Australia and the state's biggest city. Named after Queen Adelaide, the city was founded in 1836 as the planned capital of the only freely settled British province in Australia. It's seen as one of the more progressive cities in Australia, being the first city to give women the right to vote, the first to recognize Aboriginal land rights, the first to abolish capital punishment, and the first to legalize nude swimming. John Bunting was an angry man who hated many people based on their race or lifestyle. Hating them wasn't enough, though. He needed to rid the world of them. But instead of taking this misguided journey on his own, he indoctrinated others into believing his hate was justified and those people deserved to die. This is Monsters. On August 16, 1994, at 8am, 79-year-old Jack Finch and his brother, 76-year-old Ron Finch, set off on their 4,000-acre property to spray weed killer. Their farm was located in Lower Light, a small community about 50 kilometers or 30 miles north of Adelaide. As Jack drove an old truck with a tank of weed poison in the back, Ron walked beside the truck and sprayed the weeds. After lunch, they started spraying a different part of the property, and soon Ron yelled at Jack to stop the truck. There was a spot in the dirt that looked like a fox burrow, but when they looked around, they found a human skull not far away. This made them realize that the fox burrow was in fact a shallow grave. When police arrived, they found a number of human bones in the grave, and the rest had been scattered around the property by animals. There was no clothing and nothing to identify the body. The forensic pathologist ruled out the remains being those of 12-year-old Rihanna Baru, who went missing from Morfet Vale just south of Adelaide on October 2, 1992. She's never been found. He said the remains came from someone possibly in their late teens, and authorities broadcast their findings, looking for anyone who knew who he was. But they didn't have any luck. The identity remained a mystery. John Bunting was born on September 4, 1966, in an impoverished suburb of Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, to Tom and Jan Bunting. He was their only child and they were a working-class family making enough to live comfortably. Tom worked at a print shop and he loved playing the guitar until an accident with an industrial cutter took his fingers. I can tell you from experience, that's a guitar player's nightmare. Jan worked as a secretary at a local office. By all accounts, John grew up with an average childhood. He was very interested in astronomy and would take pictures of the moon through a telescope. Not only that, but he would develop the pictures himself in a makeshift darkroom. He wanted to study physics and chemistry in high school, but he hadn't passed the prerequisite math classes, so he wasn't allowed. His interest in chemistry might have had something to do with reports that John began killing. He started with insects that he would drop into different types of acid to see how they would die. He eventually graduated to torturing and killing cats and dogs. John and a friend dug a tunnel, 4 meters or 13 feet deep, 1.5 meters or 5 feet high, and about 5 meters or 16 feet long. As someone who spent most of their life in construction, that's a lot of digging and a lot of dirt to find another place for. Digging the hole is only half the battle. Finding somewhere to pile all that dirt is another. At any rate, John and his friend were trying to build an underground room in the backyard. They had reinforced it with wood and bricks, but eventually Tom found out and made them fill it in. When John was 15 years old, he had a sexual encounter with a girl who ended up getting pregnant. She went on to have the baby, but John didn't have much of a relationship with his daughter, and they eventually lost contact. He eventually turned his attention to weapons and would build his own rockets with gunpowder he extracted from bullets. This hobby led him to begin reading about World War II, which of course led him to the ideology of Nazism and white supremacy. He attempted to purchase a Nazi flag and an SS uniform, but was unsuccessful. He painted a swastika inside the trunk of his car, but Jan saw it and painted over it. The interest in Nazism understandably increased John's racism and homophobia. He developed an intense hatred for homosexuals and pedophiles, which, of course, he mistakenly believed were connected. This may have come from an encounter that John claimed to have happened when he was eight years old. 
he told some people that he and a friend were beaten and sexually assaulted by the friend's older brother. He said that when the friend's father came home, the brother took off on a motorcycle and he was killed in a crash. That part of the story appears to be untrue, as it's also reported that the older brother threatened John to not tell anybody a few weeks after the assault. He said that he never told his parents. After high school, John worked a handful of menial jobs, one being at a crematorium, and lived in a home with roommates. In 1986, John and a group of friends decided to move to Western Australia. The group never made it to Western Australia because one of the vehicles broke down and they ended up in Adelaide. They eventually got an apartment and settled in. For a while, John worked at a meat processing plant. He worked shifts at the evisceration table where organs were cut out of the animal's body and in the byproducts area where he bagged meat meal, which is what's left after meat is rendered down to contain no more water. It's basically meat concentrate. Where most people would find this job disgusting, people said that John seemed to enjoy it. John met Veronica Tripp in 1989 while they were both taking a vocational course in welding and the two began dating. She would say in a later interview that they would always go see horror movies because that's what John liked. She never got to pick the movie. This controlling behavior was reinforced by the fact that Veronica was only 18 years old and suffered from intellectual difficulties and was reported to not be able to read very well. She was someone that John could easily control, which is how he liked it. When Veronica turned 19, she moved in with John and his roommates. The couple were married in September of 1989, but continued living in the same house with the roommates. Eventually, in December of 1991, they moved into their own house on Waterloo Corner Road in Adelaide. On the next street over from their new home lived 36-year-old Barry Lane. At the welding course, John also met a man named Mark Hayden. Mark was actually born Mark Lawrence on December 4, 1958, and was raised primarily by his dad. His mother suffered from schizophrenia and spent much of her time in various mental health facilities. He had an older brother who died in a car accident in 1972. He began working at the auto manufacturing plant that his father worked at but was fired for stealing two years later. After that, he didn't really hold down any sort of steady job. At some point, he changed his name to Mark Hayden. Robert Wagner was born on November 28, 1971, in New South Wales, and his father abandoned him and his older sister when he was only six months old. His mother moved them to Adelaide when he was three. He was only seven when he attempted to commit suicide by taking an overdose of his mother's sleeping pills. It was eventually revealed that a teenage family friend had sexually abused Robert. After the abuse, Robert's behavior went downhill and he stopped showing up for school. He dropped out for good when he was 13 years old. After that, he began disappearing from home for days at a time. His mother would report him missing, but he would always show back up after a few days. Eventually, Robert introduced her to the person he had been spending his time with, and to her horror, it turned out to be a man with a record of sexual assault against underage boys. This man was Barry Lane. Robert's mother begged him to stop seeing Barry, but he refused. The next year, when Robert was only 14 and Barry was 31, they disappeared together. Robert's mother reported him missing, but the two weren't seen again for four years. It turned out that Barry had taken Robert away so that the authorities wouldn't separate them. Once Robert turned 18, they returned to Adelaide where they lived together at Barry's house, a block over from the future home of John and Veronica. When the couple moved into the house a few years later, they met Barry and Robert as they took one of their usual walks around the neighborhood. Now, John had already developed an extreme hatred of homosexuals and pedophiles, so he most likely didn't like Barry and Robert when he first met them, but eventually he decided that he could save Robert from his situation. Believing that the young man was coerced into the relationship by Barry, possibly one of the only accurate things that John ever thought about someone, he began spending time with him in an effort to free him from the relationship. He also believed that Barry could be of use in finding other pedophiles that were in need of some vigilante justice. Clinton Trezice was an openly gay 18-year-old who lived by himself in an apartment in Adelaide's north suburbs. He had a rough childhood and his parents had divorced when he was three, putting him and his younger brother in foster care. Once he was out on his own, he lived a pretty quiet life, but he was friends with a couple named Barry and Robert. Over time, Robert was convinced by John to hate homosexuals and pedophiles. He began distancing himself from Barry, so Barry was setting his sights on Clinton. 
Soon, John and his buddies had figured out the best ways to work the system, and he quit his job at the meat processing plant. He did some work under the table while collecting government assistance. The area they lived in was one of the poorest suburbs in Adelaide. John saw everyone around him living on government assistance, but he was working long hours to bring home the same amount of money, so he decided to quit his job and milk the system as well. This left John full days to spend hanging around the house with Robert, but with Robert always came Barry. John wanted to kill Barry, but as long as he was with Robert, he knew he couldn't, so this left Clinton. Clinton spent a lot of time hanging out with the group, and on October 31st, 1992, John began taunting him. When Clinton tried to laugh off John's insults, John said, You think it's funny? You think it's funny to touch little kids that can't protect themselves? Clinton had done nothing to indicate that he had ever harmed a child, but as far as John was concerned, he was gay, so he was also a pedophile. Clinton responded, Fuck off. John stormed out of the room, and Clinton shot a puzzled look at Robert and Barry. He began to speak, but was cut off when a spade shovel slammed into the back of his head. Clinton fell to the floor with a visible dent in his head. John screamed, Fuck off! Fuck you! And swung the shovel again, striking a blow to Clinton's face that completely caved it in. Robert started to panic, but Barry calmed him down. Barry knew that his own criminal record would get him sent to prison, and any objection to John would get him killed. So the best thing he could do was keep calm and help get rid of the body. Barry and Robert cut out the carpet around Clinton and rolled it around his body. Barry pulled his pickup truck to John's house, and the three men loaded the rolled-up carpet into the bed. They all crammed into the front seat and drove up Highway A1 north to Lower Light. There, they dug a shallow grave and dumped Clinton's body in. For a while, people asked about Clinton, but Robert just shrugged it off, claiming the young man was a drifter and probably just took off. It wasn't until 1995 that Clinton's mother would finally report him missing to the police. Police would connect this report to the remains that were found in lower light the previous year, but when an expert compared a picture of Clinton with the skull, they determined that it wasn't a match. It in fact was, but the quote-unquote expert made a mistake that would leave the young man's remains unidentified for another four years. Suzanne Allen was another resident in the neighborhood. She had a 26-year-old tenant named Ray Davies who lived in a trailer on her property. He was developmentally disabled, and she also helped care for him, kinda. She helped him navigate life a little bit, but she also took advantage of him. When he was struggling to make rent, she took payment in the form of sexual favors. Ray was another person that John liked to have around because he was easy to manipulate and control. After the murder of Clinton, Veronica found out about it, but she remained with John and kept her mouth shut out of fear for her life. Their physical relationship was pretty much over, and John started sleeping with other women. One of those women was Suzanne. They began a relationship of casual sex where John developed a high level of control over her. Over the next few weeks, John satisfied his appetite for death by torturing and killing animals. He was still married to Veronica and having sex with Suzanne when he met a woman named Elizabeth Harvey. She was recently divorced and a perfect victim for John to manipulate into another relationship where he was in total control. Unlike his relationship with Suzanne, which was strictly for sex, John began courting Elizabeth like a girlfriend. It was through Elizabeth that John would meet James Vlasakis, who went by Jamie. Jamie was Elizabeth's teenage stepson who grew up being abused by his father and stepbrother, another person that would be easily indoctrinated into John's twisted views. He immediately took a liking to Jamie, which only made Elizabeth feel more secure in the relationship. After a year of dating, he invited both Elizabeth and Jamie to come live with him at his house, which he still lived at with his wife. She knew about the affair, but didn't know what to do about it. She would usually just avoid social events where the other woman would be, but now they were going to live together. The very reason John got together with her was because she was developmentally disabled, which made her easier to manipulate. By this time, she believed it was her fault that John was moving on with someone else. She hadn't done a good enough job satisfying him. John seemed to think that Veronica would just grow to accept the arrangement, but she didn't. Over the next year, she would go stay with family members for longer and longer periods of time until she eventually just never came back. They never officially divorced, but John began to refer to Elizabeth as his wife and Jamie as his stepson, and that was that. In 1995, John started training Jamie by including him in the hunting, torturing, and killing of animals. 
He was happy to find out just how receptive this young, easily influenced boy was to his teachings. He eventually moved from killing animals to talking about killing a person. The timing of the discovery of Clinton's remains was perfect. The police had no leads, so they broadcast the information on the television show Australia's Most Wanted, which John watched regularly. When the story of Clinton came on the screen, John leaned over and whispered to Jamie and Elizabeth, I did that. He was a pedo. After a minute, Elizabeth responded, Good on you. John knew that he had them fully committed to his cause. John developed a list of suspected pedophiles who he would harass, sometimes suggesting they kill themselves or else he would report them to the police. His focus eventually fell on Ray after rumors started spreading that he tried to sexually assault two young boys. Ray was the type of guy who would run out of his trailer anytime he heard any type of commotion. Sometimes he would fail to make sure he was fully dressed. One day, while Suzanne's grandsons were playing outside, he heard a noise and came storming out sans pants. The boys screamed and ran off to tell their grandmother. When the story got around the neighborhood, Ray had become a pedophile and John decided that he needed to go. In December of 1995, John and Robert snuck into Ray's trailer in the middle of the night and dragged Ray through the backyard into John's house where Jamie and Elizabeth were waiting. Ray didn't understand what was going on and thought that they were playing. They pushed him into the bathroom and put a rope around his neck, tightening it until Ray could just barely breathe. With a cricket bat, a socket wrench, and some pliers, the four took turns beating and torturing Ray. After 30 minutes, they tightened the rope more and killed him. John and Jamie dug a grave in their backyard and buried Ray's body. Suzanne didn't seem to question the disappearance of her tenant. John and his followers took the trailer and fixed it up so they could sell it a few months later. They gave the proceeds to Suzanne, maybe as hush money, nobody knows. Suzanne would have been the only person looking for him, he had no other family, so his disappearance was never reported. She did continue to receive Ray's benefits, which John would collect from her. In 1996, John, Elizabeth, and Jamie moved into a bigger house in Murray Bridge, about 100 kilometers or 60 miles southeast of their house on Waterloo Corner Road. John regularly went back to the old neighborhood, mostly to pick up money from Suzanne, but in November of 1996, she disappeared. It's likely that she was murdered by John, but the story that he would tell people was that he went to her home and she was already dead. Since he didn't want to lose the income from Ray's benefits, he dismembered her body and buried her in the same grave as Ray, since the house he used to live in was still unoccupied. Suzanne's brother reported her missing and it only took them a couple of months to find that her benefits were still being paid and the address listed belonged to John Bunting. They questioned him at the beginning of 1997 and he told the police that Suzanne had lived with him for a while but she moved away and wasn't interested in talking to her family due to a dispute they were having. The police believed him. Like many serial killers do, the frequency of killings began to increase. By 1997, Robert had completely renounced his homosexuality and refused to mention his relationship with Barry. He was fully in John's camp of hatred towards homosexuals and other races. Robert had begun dating a woman, Maxine Cole, and one of her friends was a gay man named Michael Gardner. Michael's father had died when he was young and his mother remarried, but his relationship with his stepfather was bad so he was put into foster care. Instead, he spent most of that time living with his older sister or friends. People say he was an easygoing guy and he regularly babysat Maxine's kids. By all accounts, he was great with the kids, but of course, to Robert, he was likely going to sexually abuse them. In September of 1997, Michael's roommate went out of town, so John and his crew snagged him from his house and took him to a shed on John's property in Murray Bridge. They did the same thing to him that they did to Ray and ended by strangling him to death. Mark Hayden was now married to a woman named Elizabeth and lived in an area outside of their old stomping grounds. John began passing the money he made off of his victims to Mark and he helped John cover up his crimes. It was a closed down bank in a small town called Snowtown, about 150 kilometers or 95 miles north of Adelaide, that first caught their attention. The money they were receiving from Ray and Suzanne's benefits would cover the rent and the vaults were the perfect place to store the bodies of his victims. Mark rented the bank building so it wasn't connected to John. 
Inside the bank vault, John placed a bunch of 50-gallon plastic barrels and he purchased the supplies to make various acids which he would use to try to dissolve the bodies. The first victim he would take to his new storage facility would be Michael. His body was placed into a barrel of acid. At this time, Barry knew that he was feeding victims to a killer and didn't want to do it anymore. He had found himself another young troubled man to move in with him. Thomas Trevilian was 18 years old when he met Barry and moved into his house. John and Robert saw this as their opportunity to take Barry out. He had outlived his usefulness since he was no longer giving them names of potential victims and he was starting to talk to other people about the murder of Clinton Trezice. It didn't help that he was preying on another young man. John used his charm to turn Thomas to his side, so when he showed up at Barry's house in October, he already had an ally inside the home. After questioning Barry about who he had told what, Thomas grabbed him and pushed him into the bathroom. First, Barry was forced to call his mother, where he told her he was leaving town and then called her a bunch of names. After this, he was tortured until he gave up his banking information. Then he was killed. He was the second body that would be placed in a barrel in Snowtown. Thomas began breaking down pretty quickly after the murder of Barry. He had told a friend about the murder and John could see he was having trouble keeping it together. In November, John and Robert went to Thomas's house and ordered him to get into their car. He complied. They took Thomas out into the woods where they tied him up in a tree with a noose. Due to his history of mental illness, when his body was discovered a month later, it was quickly ruled a suicide. Jamie had developed a close relationship with John, but he still had his own life. Unfortunately, that life involved shooting heroin, and one of his shooting friends was 29-year-old Gavin Porter. John immediately didn't like Gavin, and that was because he thought that drug addicts were subhuman. However, he didn't want to create tension between himself and his stepson, so he tolerated Gavin's presence. That was until John sat down on the couch one day and got poked by a used syringe. John knew right then that Gavin had to go. In April of 1998, Gavin had spent the morning working on his car, then he did some drugs and passed out in the front seat. When John and Robert arrived home, they attacked Gavin inside his car. Gavin was able to fight back and stab John in the hand with a screwdriver, but the two men overpowered him and he was eventually strangled to death. They placed him in the shed and when Jamie got home, they showed him his friend's body. A few days later, John had Jamie help him load the bodies into a plastic barrel and take it out to the vault in Snowtown. Soon after, Gavin's car disappeared. It was like he was never there, and they told people that he had moved somewhere else. It seemed that John felt like he needed to protect Jamie. He had taken out his friend that he did drugs with. Now he set his sights on his half-brother, who Jamie said had sexually abused him as a child. Troy Yudd and his father, who was Jamie's stepfather, would make a game out of molesting Jamie. When Troy asked Elizabeth if he could come live with them, John immediately agreed. Jamie was upset at first, but John made it clear that this was his chance to get revenge. Troy wanted to live with them so he could escape the abuse from his father, but instead he began living with an even bigger predator. Troy didn't even make it a day in the house before he was killed. The first night he was there, he woke up in the middle of the night with John, Jamie, and Robert standing over him. With this victim, Jamie was the primary aggressor who tortured his stepbrother for hours before killing him. Then he dismembered the body and it was taken to Snowtown with the others. Troy's belongings didn't even get unpacked, which made it that much easier to remove any trace of him from the house. Then John told the rest of the family lies to explain the young man's absence. The house seemed like a place that didn't ask a lot of questions. Mark Hayden was friends with John, but he didn't take an active role in the murders. He knew about them and he helped hide the bodies. By 1998, he was living with his wife, her sister Gail Sinclair, and Gail's son, Fred Brooks. By this time, John was having an affair with Gail. He spent days at a time over at Mark's house, and he told his wife Elizabeth that he had taken a job as a truck driver. Like everyone else in this story, Fred had a rough upbringing. His parents split up when he was young, and he was placed in foster care. Then he was reunited with his father when he was 15, only to have his parents get back together shortly after. Then they split up again. Fred stayed with his mother, and they moved to Adelaide to live with his aunt and uncle, Elizabeth and Mark Hayden. He had re-enrolled in school so he could get his diploma because he hoped to join the Air Force. It's unclear exactly why Fred was chosen to be their next victim, 
It suggested that Mark's wife, Elizabeth, had been asking too many questions and he wanted to scare her into silence. It's also suggested that John became convinced that Fred was a pedophile. Either way, the 18-year-old vanished in September of 1998. There are different accounts of what happened to him. Some say that he was killed at Mark's house by John and Robert. Others say he was taken to another house where Jamie was also involved. One thing that John did do, like other victims, was force Fred to make recordings, saying he was taking off with a girl and that he wanted to be left alone. After Fred was killed, Elizabeth seemed to quit asking questions and Gail cut off her relationship with John. Gail reported him missing to the police, but John told her that he saw the boy at the gas station and he was angry. Then John called Gail and played one of the recordings which convinced her that Fred was still alive. Eventually, the police were notified that Fred wasn't missing. John's appetite to kill had overtaken him, and his next victim proved that the murders had nothing to do with them being pedophiles. John just liked killing. Gary O'Dwyer was only a toddler when he was put into foster care and he was quickly taken in by Maureen Fox. He lived with her and a number of other foster children, and though Maureen did her best with the young boy, he left her home when he was 15 years old. From there, he floated around, sometimes living on the streets and turning to petty crime to support his drug habit. In 1994, Gary was hit by a car and left in a ditch to die. A good Samaritan found him and took him to the hospital where he was in a coma for a week. After he woke up, he spent six months rehabilitating before finally being released. In 1997, Gary moved to a rental house in Murray Bridge where he eventually met Jamie. With John now needing another victim, he asked Jamie if they could quote-unquote do Gary. Jamie agreed and a few months later they snuck into Gary's house in the middle of the night. Then they tortured him with the use of electricity. Instead of beating him, they took their time and drew it out as long as they could. Of course, they had made sure to get his financial information in the process. Then they stuffed his body in a barrel in Snowtown. Maureen worried when she hadn't heard from Gary for a while, but she didn't want to be pushy, so she didn't report him missing. John was quickly fiending for another kill, and he didn't have to look far to find it. Elizabeth Hayden had become far too big of a liability. She had stopped asking outright questions, but she didn't stop looking for answers. She would squeeze little bits of information out of Mark and then go over their finances to match the information. She had developed a breakdown of where all the money was coming from with names and dates. She had enough information to go to the police, but at this point she was trying to tie up some loose ends before she did. John would know it was her and she needed to prepare to hide after she went to the authorities. Unfortunately, she wouldn't live long enough to make it to that point. In November of 1998, she made a comment about the bank building being rented in Snowtown and said something about wanting to visit there. Mark's suspicion that she was up to something was confirmed and he knew she was getting too close. He passed this information on to John, which officially sealed her fate. On November 21st, Mark and Gail were both gone for the day, so John and Robert slipped into the house and surprised Elizabeth. They didn't torture her like the other victims. She was pinned to the ground and strangled. Mark had not specifically asked for his wife to be killed, but he knew she would be. When he came home, he helped load her body into his truck and they drove it out to Snowtown. Her body was put in a barrel full of acid and placed into the makeshift tomb with the others. When Detective Paul Schramm took over the major crime branch of the South Australian police, he began putting more time into cold case files of missing persons. He began reviewing Clinton Trezise's file, noting that it was at a dead end since they still believed that his remains were not his remains. In November, a missing persons report was filed for a man named Barry Lane, and detectives noted that he was a known associate of Clifford. That seemed like a pretty big coincidence. They spent the next seven months searching for Barry and eventually talked to a previous neighbor of his who told them that they should talk to a man named John Bunting. When a detective called John, Elizabeth answered and told him that John had seen Barry a few weeks prior, but they didn't know where he lived. Then she told him to talk to Robert Wagner. Robert told the detective that he hadn't talked to Barry in years, but he had seen him at a shopping center a few weeks ago. Now that the disappearances of Clinton and Barry were connected, the detectives began digging deeper. They found that Barry received benefits, which were automatically deposited into his bank every other week. Up until his disappearance, he would withdraw the funds from an ATM near his house. 
After his disappearance, the funds were withdrawn from an ATM at a gas station much further away. They decided to go to the gas station and look at the camera footage. The camera footage showed a man that the detectives didn't immediately recognize, but a few days later a patrol officer identified the man in the video as Robert Wagner. A few weeks later, when Barry's next benefit payment came in, police tailed Robert as he drove to the gas station, used the ATM, and took money from Barry's account. Then they followed him to a friend's house who they identified as John Bunting. Unfortunately, there were still so many questions about the missing persons and their connections to John and Robert. Authorities didn't move in right away. They wanted to tap their phones, but there weren't enough resources, so they were forced to wait. But there was other work happening at a different police station. Elizabeth Hayden had been reported missing by her brother just days after her disappearance, and police had brought both Mark and Galen for interviews. Mark told the detective that they hadn't been getting along for a few days and the last time he saw her was the morning before he went to visit his father in a nursing home, but she was gone when he got back. He hadn't seen her or her vehicle, a two-tone Toyota Land Cruiser, since. When the detective saw that John was around during the time of Elizabeth's disappearance, he questioned him as well. Unsurprisingly, his story matched Mark's. On November 27th, missing persons investigator Janet Forrest was following up on the progress of the investigation into Elizabeth Hayden's disappearance, and as she read through the notes, she saw a name she recognized, John Bunting. She brought this to the attention of the major crime squad that was working the case of Clinton Trezice and Barry Lane. It just so happened they had also reopened the case of Suzanne Allen's disappearance, which was also connected to John Bunting the focus of all the disappearances turned to foul play. John thought that he was smarter than everyone. This is a common trait in murderers, but he killed people that he knew, and some were pretty well connected to him. When several people around you go missing in rapid succession, people tend to get curious. Just saying. Now that John and subsequently Robert were linked to all of these missing persons reports, the cases took priority and both men were put under surveillance. The investigation into Suzanne's disappearance revealed that her benefits were being deposited into her bank and quickly withdrawn from an ATM near John's house. Then, in February of 1999, John moved to a house in northern Adelaide, and amazingly, the benefits started being withdrawn from an ATM in that neighborhood. What a coincidence. When they obtained camera footage from that ATM, it was John at the machine. Then investigators added the disappearance of Ray Davies to the case. He was yet another person connected to John who disappeared, but was still receiving government benefits. Like Suzanne, funds were being withdrawn from a bank in Murray Bridge until John moved, then they were being withdrawn from a bank in Northern Adelaide. These withdrawals were being made at the counter, and in the surveillance footage was none other than John Bunting. Yep, smarter than everyone, a real genius. Despite the police closing in on John and his murderous crew, they would be too late to save the life of David Johnson. David was Jamie's stepbrother and Elizabeth Harvey's stepson. Jamie had always treated David well and looked out for him. This was why David came to him for help when he wanted to buy a used computer. He knew that Jamie could help him find a good deal and go with him to pick it up so he didn't get mugged. And Jamie didn't fail him. A couple of days later, he came back to David with a computer that was in his price range. David was thrilled, and he knew not to question the source of the computer, just to accept the offer while he still could. Jamie said he could go with him to Snowtown to pick it up. On May 9, 1999, David and Jamie drove to Snowtown and went into an old bank building. Inside, they went into one of the offices where Robert was waiting with the computer. As David walked up to have a look at the computer, Robert grabbed him by the throat. He put handcuffs on David and then set him down in the office. They took his wallet and forced him to give them his ATM pin. Then they recorded him saying different names and phrases that they could use to leave messages for different people, trying to make it look like David was still alive. John and Robert spent some time beating David, but then John told Robert and Jamie to go to the ATM and make sure the pin worked. While John was alone, David took the chance and tried to escape. He got his handcuffed hands to the front of his body and managed to kick John in the chest hard enough to crack a few ribs. Then he dove on the floor and tried to grab a knife. David didn't know for sure that John was alone, and when John called to other people for help, David looked over at the door. 
John grabbed David while he was distracted and used a belt to strangle him to death. By the time Robert and Jamie were back, David was dead. With John's injury, Robert and Jamie had to carry David into the vault and deposit him into a barrel. When Robert came back out of the vault, he had a small chunk of flesh that he had cut off of David's leg. After cleaning up, they walked to a friend's house who lived across the street from the bank and cooked up the piece of flesh. Then they ate it, encouraging the friend to try a piece without telling him what it was. The following day, John told David's family that he had gotten a 13-year-old pregnant and had crashed his car. He had taken off in order to hide from the police. Then, Jamie went to David's apartment and got paperwork so they could continue collecting his unemployment benefits. On May 16, 1999, investigators went to Snowtown to check out an address that had come up during recorded conversations between John and Robert. As one detective walked by the house, just to see if anything stuck out, he noticed a two-tone Toyota Land Cruiser parked on the property. This looked like the same vehicle that Mark's neighbors said they usually saw at his house. That was until just after Elizabeth disappeared, when they saw people loading garbage bags into it, and then the vehicle disappeared. Four days later, on March 20th, detectives knocked on the door with a search warrant. The friend told them that the vehicle belonged to his friends, John Bunting and Robert Wagner. He said they had parked it there and that there were several barrels in the back that smelled awful. They told him that the barrels contained kangaroo carcasses and that they rented the bank across the street to store them in. Luckily for the investigators, the man had a key as John and Robert let him use the building for storage. Police entered the bank from the side door and cleared the rooms. They found unused garbage bags and a receipt for air fresheners, rubber gloves, and more garbage bags. The last room to check was the vault, but it was locked. One of the detectives dusted a visible fingerprint on the vault door, and when he went back to the friend's house to get his camera, he told him that the vault was locked. Lucky for the investigators, he knew how to open it. It turned out that the lock didn't actually function properly and you could use a piece of bent wire to engage or disengage the locking mechanism. Back at the bank, the detective used the wire and opened the vault. Inside, they were met by a piece of black plastic covering the doorway into the vault. There was a slit down the middle of the plastic and it was sealed by a piece of tape. Between the vault door and the plastic, they found a wallet, a roll of packing tape, two keys, and a book of lined writing paper. As they pulled the tape to gain access to the room, they were hit with the familiar smell of death. Inside were six plastic barrels, all sealed with screw-top lids. On top of one barrel was a pair of handcuffs and a knife. Two more knives and a pair of rubber gloves sat on another barrel. The police cleared the building and called for a forensics team to come in. When investigators looked in the wallet, they found the ID of David Johnson. It was the evening of the same day that the forensic examiners arrived at the bank. When they opened the first two barrels, they could see human remains and liquid. John had attempted to dissolve the bodies in acid, but since he never was able to get into that chemistry program, he clearly didn't know what he was doing. He didn't use enough acid, and the water content from the human bodies diluted the solution enough that it really didn't do anything. Later pH testing would show that the solution was neutral. The barrels were resealed and transported to the State Forensic Science Center in Adelaide. Eventually, it was determined that there were eight bodies between the six barrels. Some bodies were intact, others had been dismembered. One had just had their feet cut off so they would fit in the barrel. Eventually, the bodies in the barrels were identified as Michael Gardner, Barry Lane, Gavin Porter, Troy Yud. Frederick Brooks, Gary O'Dwyer, Elizabeth Hayden, and David Johnson. The morning of May 21st, John Bunting, Robert Wagner, and Mark Hayden were arrested and all charged with one count of murder. Investigators knew it was more, but until they knew how many victims they had, one charge of murder was enough to get the ball rolling. At this time, none of the information that detectives had uncovered connected Jamie to any of the crimes. Authorities did, however, find it hard to believe that Elizabeth Harvey didn't help in some capacity, even if just in the fraud to receive the victim's benefits. Elizabeth denied any involvement in any crime and said she didn't believe John and Robert had killed anyone. The detective pressed her about participating in changing the address for Suzanne's benefits, but she claimed to have no involvement. 
except when they searched her purse, they found a letter from the bank addressed to Suzanne at her and John's house in Murray Bridge. Oops. Hey, let's murder a bunch of people we know, steal their benefits, and then carry around evidence with us. Brilliant. She eventually changed her tune and told the detectives the story that John had found Suzanne dead. John, Robert, and Mark all refused to talk to the detectives. Jamie, on the other hand, was spilling his guts to one of his friends. That friend turned around and called the police. Among some of the details revealed by Jamie was the fact that there was at least one body buried on the property at the house on Waterloo Corner Road, and the friend relayed this detail to police. When investigators dug up the property, they found the remains of Susan Allen and Ray Davies. Jamie eventually contacted a lawyer who made an arrangement for him to turn himself in. Jamie fully cooperated with the police and told them about 12 murders. He told them that Thomas Trevelyan was murdered and did not commit suicide. He eventually pleaded guilty to four murders and was sentenced to life in prison with parole after 26 years. The prosecution wanted to charge John, Robert, and Mark with all of the murders, but they realized that the evidence against Mark was weak, most likely because he didn't really participate in the murders. He was more involved in hiding the bodies and stealing the benefits. He was granted a separate trial where he was charged with the murders of Troy Yud and Elizabeth Hayden, along with six charges of concealing bodies. He was found guilty of five of the charges of concealing bodies. The jury wasn't convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he was involved in the murder of Troy or Elizabeth, or that he helped conceal David Johnson's body. He eventually took a deal to plead guilty to assisting in the murders of Troy and Elizabeth. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. John and Robert went to trial together. John Bunting was charged with 12 murders and was found guilty of 11 murders as the jury couldn't be sure if Suzanne Allen had been murdered or if she died of natural causes. Robert Wagner was charged with 10 murders and was found guilty on all counts. They were both sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Elizabeth Harvey was diagnosed with cancer and it looks like she wasn't charged in connection with the frauds. She died in 2001. John Bunting decided that he was going to live his life based on hate. He convinced himself that the people he hated deserved to die, and then he convinced himself that the people around him fit that category. He thought he was superior because he was taking out monsters, but it was really him that was the monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.